ladies and gentlemen we are following lectures on first module of ocean structures and materials today we will discuss the 11th lecture on the first module of ocean structures and materials the presentation outline for the current lecture will be the following we will talk about a summary of types of coastal structures which we discussed in the previous two lectures we will talk about the geometric form the structural action the materials which are exercised by different kinds of coastal structures we will also discuss about the shape size and dimensions of typical coastal structures in this presentation we will also talk about very briefly their functional characteristics of this structural systems this is a brief overview of different kinds of coastal structures which have discussed so far if you look at this table we'll talk about the different types of coastal structures starting from sea dikes sea walls revetments bulkheads groins breakwaters submerged sills beach drains jetties training walls and storm surge barriers some of the photographs of different kinds of coastal structures constructed elsewhere in the world are also summarized here the main objective and the principal function and the essential features of these types of coastal structures are summarized in this table for your ready reference coastal structures are used in coastal defense schemes with main objective of preventing the shoreline erosion and flooding of the hinterland sheltering of harbor basins and harbor entrances against the wave action stabilization of navigation channels at the inlets and protection of water intakes and outfall systems are additional objectives of any type of coastal structures the photographs you see here are already been explained in the previous lecture these are photographs of different sea dikes what has been constructed elsewhere in different parts of the world now what are sea dikes sea dikes are geometric form of trapezoidal in shape which are constructed to maintain the desired slope that can limit erosion they are very long in length and very high in cross section they are very massive form of structural geometry if you look at the material which are commonly used for construction of sea dikes the following are the material which are preferred for construction of sea dikes sea dikes are essentially built as a mound of fine material like sand and clay with a gentle seaward slope this is done in order to reduce the wave run up and the erodible effect of the waves surface of the dikes are generally armored with either glass asphalt stones or concrete slabs to prevent the erosion of the fine material which has been used as a mound to construct the sea dikes a typical cross section of a sea dike is shown in the picture here for example the low tide level is indicated in black color here this is my submerged quay which we are constructing here and you are using filters in the downward slope here and this is the closed covering area this is nothing but the clay or a finer sand material which has been used to construct the dike of course on the upper crust and the leeward and the backward side can have even grass as the armored protection for the covered layer so this is a decent cross section of a proposed sea dike which has been commonly practiced in coastal protection systems there are different geometric forms you can see for sea dikes here for example if this is my design water level at which i have got to construct or for which i should design the sea dike then the slope initially is given as gentle as 1 is to 10 then the slope raises to 1 is to 3 and 1 is to 5 and further 1 is to 3 then the crest and then 1 is to 3 generally the upper portion of the crest here is used by grass on clay to armor the clay or the sand material of the dike to protect it from the top whereas for a certain slope of 1 is to 5 to prevent the ability or capability of the sea dike to protect the sea dikes from surface run up 
asphalt lining is being given. So, rubble stones are generally put at the entry level of the sea deck here, so that erosion is minimized here. Generally the design water level calculated for designing the sea dikes are about 200 years return period. You can also do something called the crust level overtopping can also be done with grass with 1 meter clay. So, you can also cover the sand with help of the bounded material which is grass which can be used as an armored material for covering the slope or the protecting the slope. So, generally the slope here is much more gentle compared to that of the leeward slope. At the end of the slope you also have what is called as a tow drain which collects the run up from the surface which can be reused later for maintaining the sea dikes. So, these are two common geometric forms which have been practiced for sea dike construction in coastal protection systems. Let us look at the functional aspects of a sea dike. They are actually low permeable structures which are essentially watertight systems that are built for protecting the low lying areas against flooding. Fine materials such as sand, silty sand and clay are essentially used for construction of sea dikes. Seaside slope is usually gentle as we saw in the previous picture which is to a slope of 1 is to 10 whereas, the other side the slope is much steeper may be in the order of 1 is to 5 or 1 is to 3 even. The seaside slope is kept gentle in order to reduce the wave run up and the wave impact on the sea dike structures. The steepness of the rear slope is actually depending on the orientation of the plane of slip failure and also depends on what is the erosion of the piping which is being done at the rear end of the steepest part of the sea dike. So, sea dike is actually a trapezoidal cross section which has got two different slopes one on the sea side and one on the rear slope. Of course, the rear slope guidance are based on the orientation of the planes of slip failure which are happening on the rear side whereas, the sea side slope are far gentle in order to protect or prevent surface run up or the wave run up and the wave impact on the sea dikes. Steeper slopes obviously require stronger armoring otherwise the armoring is weak then the gentle material which is lying below the armored area will get washed away by the run up. The other type of coastal structure which we discussed in the previous lecture is what we call as sea walls. Two photographs you see here are two different varieties of sea walls which has been constructed elsewhere in different parts of the world. Let us look at the functional aspect of a sea wall and the geometric form. Typical onshore structures named as sea walls have a principal function of preventing flooding of land and the structures behind them due to storm surge action and waves. They are constructed generally parallel to the shoreline. Sometimes you also see a curvilinear geometric profile of sea walls as in the previous photograph. They are generally constructed parallel to the shoreline and it strengthens part of the coastal profile which we call as reinforcement of the coastal profile. They are essentially used to protect promenades, roads and houses that are placed seaward of the crest edge of the natural beach profile of the coastal side. Let us look at the structural action of a sea wall. How does it behave when it is subjected to wave actions? It is highly vulnerable to what is we call as a toes covering which causes instability to the wall. Now, the question is how to avoid this kind of toes covering. To protect these sea walls from such toes cover problems they are actually constructed together with the groins. Ladies and gentlemen you will recollect that groins are coastal protection structures which are constructed perpendicular to the coastline or the preset coast. Wave slamming, surface run up and overtopping are critical action that are responsible for structural failure of a sea wall. Let us look at the construction aspects of a sea wall. They are classified as sloping front or vertical front structures. As the name suggests if the front side of the sea wall is having a sloping gradient we call them as sloping front sea walls. On the contrary if the front side is having a vertical front we call them as vertical front sea walls. 
the sloping front structures are generally constructed using flexible rubble mound structures. They have flexibility to overcome the toe and crust erosion and therefore, they are advantageous in terms of avoiding the toe or crust erosions. The stability of slope of this kind of sloping front sea walls is a very major concern in its design in the geometric form of the sea wall. The stability of this slope depends on the intact toe support given to the front side of the sea wall. The loss of toe support generally will result in significant damage of the armor layer first, because the armor layer will get washed off by the surface runoff when the toe wall gets damaged. It also results in either a partial or a complete failure of the armored slope. Once the armored slope is failed, then the material which is lying below the armored one, which is a soft material will also get washed away and the total functionality of a sea wall, especially in case of sloping front sea walls will be completely lost. Let us quickly look at the sloping front rubble mounted sea wall, a photograph. These are three different types of sloping front rubble mounted, because we say the front side which is the sea side is having the sloping front that is why we call the sloping front and we are using rubble for mounting the surface. There is the existing beach of the dune material which has been shown here. Sometimes in general in all the three shapes we use geotextiles to strengthen or to stabilize this slope in the front side. It can be either rock rubble mound armor or it can be even a random placed concrete armor units. You can see the armoring can be done with either a rubble mounding in a regular form or you can even use concrete cubes or big blocks of concrete to do the armoring of this. However, in all the three types you will see to stabilize the slope we generally recommend geotextile layers to be put for the slope stability. If you talk about the strengthening of toe wall which is going to be one of the very serious issue as for the design point of view of sea walls are concerned, we also call them as either toe walls or return walls. So, you can see here either a return wall or a toe wall should be properly strengthened just to prevent the erosion cost because of the wave run up on the top on the slope side of the armored portion. Because if the toe wall is not protected comfortably then the armored layer may get washed off completely which will result in a design failure of a sea wall. So, a toe wall which is nothing but a protected wall at the end which is a vertical sheeting pile which can be an in situ concrete which actually protects the edge of the sea wall from serious toes covering problems encountered from the wave action. Vertical front sea wall is the picture what you see here instead of having a sloping front now I have a vertical front it can be a mass concrete it is basically a gravity based structure for a coastal protection. So, mass concrete which protects on the other side which is filled up with the sand or a loose fine material which is compact completely and then an asphalt lining layer can be given on the top to provide a proper finish on the top. So, the vertical front type sea walls have a vertical front wall which is founded below the pebbles and then you have got the rock layered armoring in front of the sea wall. This is the original profile of the beach this has been refilled using the sand or a softer material over which an asphalt lining is generally given. Generally the design height of a vertical front sea wall depends on what is the high tide level and what is the mean water level. Depending upon this oceanographic data on a specific sea state or a sea site the height of this vertical front sea walls are generally fixed upon as a design parameter. The next classical type of coastal structure what we saw in the literature in the earlier lecture is that revetments. You can see interestingly two beautiful photographs of two types of rivets which has been revetments which has been done in the structural side for coastal protection. You can see both of them have a greater similarity the front side of the sea side having a gentle slope one is having a different kind of protection system whereas the other one has different kind of geo fabric layers which are used as an armor covering for slope protection. So, either way you can construct revetments so that the slope stabilization also forms an important part of these kind of coastal protection structures. Typical onshore structures are revetments with the principal function of protecting the shoreline from erosion. 
constructed with cladding of stone, concrete and asphalt to armor the sloped natural shore line profiles. The natural shore line which is on the seaward side is protected either by cladding of stone or by concrete cladding or by even asphalt lining as we saw in the previous picture. This is a typical cross section of a revetment what you see here to protect the slope can even do what we call a vegetation or a soil layer over which an existing grading can be done and existing CKD can be removed and can be filled up. So, to protect the slope and to improve the stability of the slope I put at the end of this of the toe what we call as a bluff stone and to protect I also put what is called as a choke stone here then I put an armored layer covering to protect the slope. So, that the slope which is designed for maintaining a coastal protection should be always permanently seen that the slope does not get eroded away because of the wave run up. The next type of classical coastal protection structure is what we call as bulk heads. These are two interesting photographs of two types of bulk heads what you see in the picture. Bulk heads are actually structures primarily intended to retain or prevent sliding of land. So, the essential function of a bulkhead is similar to that of a retaining wall where retaining walls generally retain soil whereas, this retains again the leeward side of the soil from the wave action on the coastal side. Protecting the hinterland against flooding and the wave action is the secondary importance for a bulkhead essentially it prevents sliding of land. So, it is nothing but a type of a retaining wall which functions to provide or to prevent sliding of land. It is designed and constructed similar to that of soil retaining structures as you see on the road sides in hilly terrains. The common structural form is actually a vertical wall which is anchored with the tie rods. They are generally used in construction of mooring facilities in harbors and marinas to minimize them from the wave action. Here is a typical cross section of a structural form of a bulkhead. You can see this is a vertical wall which is anchored which is an anchor pile and anchored to the pile using a tie rod to provide lateral stability of this wall against wave action. So, essentially the sheathing is done here and the erosion escarpment is done on this surface. We use a filter cloth here to protect the sheathing from the soil erosion characteristics. Then we use a filling on this area to protect this filter clothing or to protect this layer on the back side of the sheathing. So, these bolts will hold the sheathing with that of the solder pile together in different position or along the length of this bulkheads. The other type of structural form what you see for coastal protection is groins. Ladies and gentlemen you can easily recollect that groins are coastal structures that are constructed generally normal to the coast shoreline perpendicular to the coast shoreline whereas, the previous type of structural forms are generally parallel or curvilinear to the coastlines. So, two photographs you see here are groin structures constructed normal to the coastline. Now, what are groins? Groins are essentially built to stabilize a stretch, a small stretch or a medium length of a stretch of coastal side of a natural or artificially nourished beach against soil erosion. It is constructed when there is a net longshore loss of the beach material, beach material is nothing but the sand. So, when you anticipate or when you monitor a longshore sediment transport of the beach material which is effectively very bad, then you want to protect the coastal line or the beach side against this kind of erosion groins are generally constructed. It functions effectively for protecting the longshore transport. The structural form of a groin is very simple, it is straight narrow type of structure which is built perpendicular to the shoreline. Series of groins are generally constructed, they are never constructed in isolation. Series of groins are otherwise referred in literature as a groin field. This results in saw tooth shaped shoreline which is a better form of protecting the shoreline from soil erosion. Groins are well designed so that they can arrest or slow down the rate of long short transport. So, the fundamental objective of a groin structure is to retard down 
the long shore transport of sedimentation. Building up of a material in a groin bay provide protection to the coastline against erosion. It is used to hold artificially nourished beach material in a very common format. It is used to prevent sedimentation or accretion in a down drift area by acting as a barrier to the long shore transport. Groins of short islands are generally recommended where you got areas with severe erosion potential. Groins can also be non perpendicular in an unusual form this can be curved shore parallel T headed at the seaward end. In most cases groins are built with sheet piles or rubble mound constructions as we saw in the earlier case of like sea walls. Rubble groins have reduced risk of scouring and formation of strong rip currents and therefore, they are preferred for many type of groin structures. Groins must protrude some distance into the zone of littoral transport. The projection dimension of this groin which is projecting into the littoral transport zone is determined by the width of the surf zone. It is classified either as long or short depending upon how far across the surf zone they are extended. They are classified as high or low depending on the possibility of sediment transport across the crust. Terminal groins extend far enough seaward to block the entire littoral transport whereas, permeable groins allow sediment to be transported through the structure. So, fundamentally these two types of groins are different in their functional point of view. Low and permeable groins have the benefit of reduced wave reflection and less rip current formation as compared to that of high and impermeable groins and therefore, low and permeable groins are generally preferred. You can see a cross sectional dimension of a groin which is being shown here. So, you can see the once the groin is constructed the erosion is controlled and accretion takes place on the other side of protection area. So, a threatened structure which can be protected from erosion on the B side which is depending upon what is the long shore direction of the long shore transport. The next common type of coastal protection structure are breakwaters. Anyway, however, detached breakwaters are more commonly used in different parts of the world. The photograph what you see here are two classical long detached breakwaters. Detachment in sense they are not continuous and parallel to the coastline can see here the detached breakwaters of specific length will always formulate a specific kind of sediment formation on the B side as seen both the photographs. Detached breakwaters are relatively small, short in length, non shore connected, near shore breakwaters. The principal function is to reduce beach erosion. They are built parallel to the shore just the seaward of the shoreline in shallow water depths. The multiple detached breakwaters spaced along the shoreline can effectively protect the substantial shoreline frontages in a very nice manner. The gap between the breakwaters are in most cases of the same order and magnitude of that of the length of the individual breakwater. Breakwaters reflect and dissipate some of the incoming wave energy. It reduces wave height in the lee side of the structure and reduces shore erosion as well. Detached breakwaters are normally built as rubble mound structures with low crust that allow significant overtopping during storm at high waters. The typical photograph and the schematic view of a detached breakwater. So, the original shoreline what you see here after constructing breakwaters you will see there is a formation of thombolos which is happening depending upon the construction and the spacing of the breakwaters. The usual design of this kind of breakwaters is that the spacing is at least 70 percent equal to the length of the breakwater itself. If you look at the formation of thombolos and the salient features of the breakwater, the spacing between the breakwater g is more or less equivalent to that of the length of the breakwater which is l. If you look at a typical cross section of a breakwater as you see in this photograph here it is a trapezoidal cross section with a low crust and lower less wider crust which allows sometimes overtopping during high tide waves. Rubble mound breakwaters are very classical examples and very common application seen 
in coastal sites you can see a very long curvilinear shaped rubble mound breakwaters in both these photographs very closely. These are rubble stones which are used for armor lining of breakwaters. They are most commonly applied type of breakwaters in the construction practices. Simple shape is a mound of stones. They are homogeneous structure of stones large enough to resist displacements due to wave forces. If made highly permeable it may result in penetration of waves and sediments if present in the area. Conventional rubble mound structures consist of a core of finer material covered by brick blocks forming the so called armor layer. Rubble mound breakwaters prevent finer material being washed out through the armor layer. Filter layers must be provided to enhance the capabilities. Lower part of the armor layer is usually supported by a tow beam except in case of shallow water structures. Concrete armor units are used as armor blocks in these areas with rough sea wave climates or at sites where sufficient amount of large quarry stones are not available. These are different cross sections as shown in the rubble mound breakwaters. In one case the breakwaters can be projected high the crest can be much above the still water level otherwise you can also have submerged breakwaters as you see here which are conventional. You can fill up the soft core using a GSC core or a quarry run material which is armored using different kinds of material as suggested in the previous slide can be either projected up or can be submerged as well. There are other types of breakwaters rubble mound breakwaters where they are built only on one side of the coast side whereas the other side is being used for sand filling as you see here. The inner core again can be either a rubble core or a quarry run material as you see in this picture. Reef breakwaters are the other type of breakwaters have been commonly used. They are in principle designed as a rubble mound structure with submerged crust. Both homogeneous and multilayer structures are constructed as reef breakwaters with an objective to prevent beach erosion. The principal function of a reef breakwater is reduction of wave heights at the shore. They are coast parallel structures either can be long or short submerged structures built with an objective of reducing the wave action on the beach by forcing wave breaking over the so called reef. Rubble mound structures constructed as a homogeneous pile of stone or concrete armor units are generally material used for construction of reef breakwaters. They are designed to be stable or it may be allowed to reshape under the wave action depending upon the design concept. Narrow crested like detached breakwaters in shallow water or in deeper waters can also be as reef breakwaters. The white crested with lower crust elevation like most natural reefs that cover a fairly wide rim of the coastal line. Besides triggering wave breaking and subsequent energy dissipation reef breakwaters can be used to regulate wave action by refraction and diffraction. They are non visible hazards to the swimmers and boats and therefore they have got to be very carefully placed along the coastal side. The next type of coastal structure what we see in the literature is submerged sills. Submerged sill is a special version of a reef breakwater which is built near the shore. It is generally used to retard offshore sand movements by introducing a structural barrier at one point on the beach profile. The sill may also interrupt the onshore sand movement considerably. Sill introduces a discontinuity in the beach profile so that the beach behind it becomes what we call as a perched beach as long as at higher elevation and thus wider than the adjacent beach. So, perched beach is specific name given for beaches which are caused at higher elevation and wider than the adjacent beaches. Submerged sills are also used to retain the beach material artificially placed on the beach profile behind the sills. Submerged sills are usually built as rock armor, rubble mound structures or commercially available prefabricated unit can be used to construct the submerged sills. Submerged sills also cause non visible hazard to the swimmers and boats because as the name suggests they are submerged in water which have a better visual impact, but cause serious hazard damages to the swimmers and the boats in the vicinity of the coastal sites. 
the other common form of coastal protection structures is jetty. You can see a beautiful photograph where boats have been parked, the vessels have been parked along the jetty side. So, then what is a jetty? Jetties are essentially used for stabilizing the navigation channels at the river mouths and tidal inlets. Shore connected structures are generally built on either side or both sides of the navigation channel perpendicular to the shore and extending into the ocean. They confine the stream or the tidal flow, therefore it is possible to reduce the channel shoaling and decrease the requirement of dredging in the navigation areas. The figure what you see here is a combination of a jetty and a groin, you can see these are all groins which are constructed and the one which is extended first far beyond up to a length of practically 2 kilometers is what we call as a jetty which is a part of a natural harbor. So, basically this stabilizes the navigation channel at the entry level or the intake level. Therefore, after construction of these jetties the littoral drift pushes the sand to the first jetty and the littoral transport takes a different phenomenal route as you see in this figure here. So, they are extended offshore of the breaker zone jetties improve the maneuvering of ships and provide shelter against the storm waves very effectively. They are similar to breakwaters in their functional characteristics. We have interesting references for this lecture as we have seen through the previous three lectures on coastal systems, Mangor Carsten shoreline management guidelines, Ahrens and Cox design and performance of brief breakwaters, Sana Siraj et al mooring force and motion response of pontoon type floating breakwaters and Yamamoto discussing moored floating breakwater response to regular and regular waves. Ladies and gentlemen, we have completed three lectures on coastal protection systems. In the next lecture that is lecture 12 on module 1, we will talk about interesting parts of questions for you which are on tutorials which can in conclude the first module lecture. Thank you very much.